so I'd like to begin with a bit of a group therapy session. Uh, so I want you to think back to the last time that you worked on a completely greenfield application. So there was no technical debt, there was no legacy, uh, there was a test suite that was comprehensive but also ran very, very quickly, and it was just you and a list of features that you needed to implement in your editor. You get that picture? So give me a word for what the feeling you might have when you were in that experience. Fantasy. Fantasy. Uh, anyone else? Joy. Joy, High yes. School. High school. <laughs> so it doesn't happen very often, right? So um, you can think about your application as a green field, but as your application continues to be developed, the complexity starts to increase. You're adding people to the team, the requirements of the business begin shifting around, and it's kind of like letting a bunch of cows sort of walk out into your green field. The problem with allowing cows into your field is they have a tendency to take a green field and quite quickly turn it into a brown field. So, uh, my name is Brian Helmkamp. I'm the founder of Code Climate. And today, we're going to talk about uh, some ways to try to change that equation, to give yourself, uh, get back into a green field, or if you have a green field project where you feel that joy, uh, to keep it around for longer with some very specific patterns for managing complexity in the domain layer. A quick warning, uh, I'm going to try to cover seven patterns and some other stuff in, uh, in this talk. It's going to move quite quickly, um, so please save questions for the end. Uh, and if we don't have time to do them uh, at the, quite at the end, I will be here and we can do them during the break, whatever, but we're going to go pretty fast. Okay, I'd like to begin with a quote. Rails makes it natural and easy to build large, well-designed, object-oriented systems. Does anybody know who said that? <laughs> so I want to look at why that is. Um, I think in that quote, the context for Rails is really mostly referring to active record. So if you think about the active record pattern, you have to go back to where it was first documented, which is Martin Fowler's book, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture, has a section on active record. It was uh, an inspiration for DHH's implementation of the pattern. And if you read Fowler's work, he very clearly articulates that the big advantage of active record is simplicity. And we see this every day, right? We feel this whenever we need to add a new model to our application and set up some sort of crud-like behavior. We can, you know, we even have generators for this sort of thing and it's very easy to get that done. But the downside that Fowler lays out, and I think that we also see every day, is that Active Record, by definition, couples your domain layer very tightly to your database schema. And this isn't so much of an issue from the standpoint of, well, your database schema is going to change, or maybe you want to stop using a relational database. I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about the fact that if you, the tools that you have for managing complexity in your domain are limited by the number of tables you have, right? So supposing you have an application which only has a few tables, but has a lot of behavior layered on top of them, if you follow the active record pattern and only apply the active record pattern, you're not gonna have a good way to deal with it, and you're gonna end up in that brown field. So sometimes people talk about well-designed object-oriented code as uh, ravioli code. Now this can have a positive or negative connotation depending on the context, but in this case I'm going to use the positive connotation, which is that you've got independent units of code uh, that are loosely coupled, they're all sort of like ravioli sliding around in the bowl, collaborating together to feed you dinner. David Chalimsky coined the phrase calzone code, and this is more like what Rails sort of leads you into. You can only really consume one calzone and you're not going to feel very good after you're done. Uh, in fact, it can lead to God objects. Uh, so this is a common problem with Rails code bases. If I opened up any of your applications today, 
I could probably, if you told me what your application did, I can probably tell you where your God objects are. Number one is user. Number two is whatever the core model is of your domain. So if you are an e-commerce company, your God objects are probably order and user. Uh, it varies by app, but that's what sort of tends to happen with Active Record. So solutions. Sometimes when people talk about ways to manage complexity in Rails applications, they use the phrase skinny controller fat model. And this was a way uh, that people would talk about trying to create cont maintainable controllers, to really have controllers be easy to work with. But I think that it's kind of caused perhaps as much harm as good, uh, because you still end up with fat models. And that's not particularly appealing. On the other hand, I think what we should be striving for is to take the skinny controllers that we have and also have combined that with a set of skinny models. Some of those will be active record models, and other objects will just be domain models that do not inherit from active record. And we're going to look at ways to do just that today. So uh, if you can read the line at the bottom that says, can you read this, then you'll be able to read the code. If you can't, go to that URL, and you'll be able to get the code samples. Uh, it's github.com slash code climate and refactoring fat models would be like the first repo. Uh, before we do patterns, I want to talk about an anti-pattern because this always comes up and it's also interesting because DCI has been coming up during the conference. Um, I don't have an opinion on DCI because I've never used it and I don't feel qualified to offer one, but I do feel like I can offer an opinion on extracting mixins, which I would say don't do. And the reason for that is uh, as we've seen and heard about, mixins are basically a form of inheritance. So you end up creating this subtle, complex inheritance hierarchy in your application, basically multiple inheritance, uh, that isn't very obvious. And it's sort of like sweeping the mess in your models under a set of a bunch of different rugs. Um, this would be, you know, the approach I'm talking about is let's say you have a user and he has friends because it's a social network to extract a mix-in called friending, right? And that adds some associations and deals with that logic. I don't care for that approach because I believe it makes it more difficult to actually see the areas for extracting uh, objects from the system because you've sort of spread it out. So I've been saying this for a while that any application with an app concerns directory is itself concerning. However, apparently uh, I have been told that Rails 4 now generates app concerns directories by default. So I think I may be getting trolled. <laughs> uh, the first pattern that I would recommend considering is value objects. So value objects are small encapsulated objects, I'm getting thumbs up for value objects, uh, that are um, based, their quality is based on their value, not their identity. And they're generally, but not always, immutable. So in the Ruby standard library, examples would be path name, uh, URI, those are some more complex examples. The simplest ones are just things like fixnum. Um, so let's look at some active record code and how, what problems it might have and how we might solve them with value objects. Um, this is a class called constant, which is a part of code climate. It's how code climate sort of uh, grades each of your classes. It gives them a rating. The rating under the hood is based on a, what we call a remediation cost. It's kind of just like a number, point number for how many smells we find. And what you can see in this code is that we have a number of methods that repeat the word rating in the method name. And that's probably one of my favorite ways to identify missing objects. If you have repeated prefixes, suffixes, words in method names in an object, it's probably telling you that there's another object to extract out of that. In this case, it's a rating. And by having the rating logic um, tied into your active record object, there's no way to have a rating class uh, instance on its own and do anything with it outside of the context of one and only one constant class. So if we were to create a value object, we could just define a class called rating. Uh, this gives us a convenient place to put a factory method for creating the proper rating given an associated cost. And we can define the 2s method, so these interpolate into strings cleanly. Uh, 
Uh, we can also give it some additional behavior, which is quite convenient. We can ask a rating what the next worst rating is. So B will give you C, C will give you D. Uh, you can have expressive predicate methods, like is this rating better than or worse than the other? Uh, and you can also define equal and hash. So now we can use ratings as keys in plain Ruby hashes, which is quite useful for us because we group uh, classes by their rating in a number of places. And it's very easy to use. You just define a method inside of your active record class, which instantiates the value object. If you've seen the method composed of in Active Record, it's kind of just like a, a shorthand way to do this very thing. Um, I think it might be deprecated in part just because it's so easy to do it yourself. But it they put it back in. It was out and then in. Okay, it was out and then back in. Thank you, Steve. Um, so you can do it yourself, or you can use composed of. I just like doing things by hand until they hurt, and then then consider reaching for sharper tools. Um, the implications of introducing the value object. Uh, as we saw, they can be comparable, so you can use them for, you can sort them, you can say greater than, less than, um, use them as hash keys, put them into strings, and we saw it provides a nice place for that factory method. So I like value objects whenever I have logic that tends to follow an attribute around. If there are data clumps, let's say you've got something like a name that always has a first and a last part, or a street address with the number and the street name, and if you find yourself using uh, Ruby or Rails primitives in a lot of cases and sort of having to layer a bunch of behavior onto your primitives, sometimes that's referred to as primitive obsession. Uh, and the cure for primitive obsession is generally value objects. Second pattern is service objects. So service objects are objects that encapsulate a single standalone operation inside of your code base. This is kind of a general term. Um, I like the book Domain Driven Design if you're interested in reading about entities, services, and values. Those are kind of my favorite takeaway from that book, which I've actually never read, but I've read blog posts that say that it's in that book. <laughs> we'll cut that out of the recording. Um, <laughs> Uh, and service objects, I like them to have a short life cycle. So they might be stateless, uh, or they, because they have a short life cycle, you just instantiate it and use it, then the state is not long lived anyway. So we'll look at an example. Uh, in this case, we have a user class, and the user class has two different ways for authentication to take place. So you can do authentication with uh, a password, and that's going to use bcrypt, or you can do authentication with a token coming over an API, and that needs to be compared uh, using this secure compare method hanging out at the bottom of the class. That's to prevent timing attacks, which I can't get into, but it's kind of an interesting security thing. Um, what I want to point out here is in real code, if you ever have something like this, usually the secure compare function is about 200 lines below the, uh, the method where it's being used in token authenticate because it's user, right? So there's all this other stuff and you want to put it in the private section way down at the bottom. And the secure compare concept doesn't really make sense from the concept, uh, from the context of just a user, right? What is user secure compare? Are you comparing one user to another? Uh, no, you're comparing two strings in a uh, constant time way. So what you could do is introduce service objects. And in this case, I would create two of them. One is a password authenticator, which just takes the user and is able to manufacture a bcrypt password object, which does a comparison, uh, can be used to verify a password, and a token authenticator. And this one's interesting because now it gives us a nice place to put that secure compare logic, right? We have a class that's all about authenticating tokens, and it has a secure compare method. Now, it's still a utility method. You could make the argument that we're still missing a class. Perhaps API token uh, is a value object that we're missing. But I like this a lot better. And this is where I would probably stop. Because now you have a small class where that code is going to be sitting together on the same screen in your editor. So to use it, say from your sessions controller, you would just instantiate an instance of the authenticator. And you would call it. This is what I mean by having a short-lived uh, life cycle. So what did we get out of that? Uh, this is going to be a common theme. We simplified the model. We can use service objects to avoid a uh, case that I refer to as callback hell. And that's when you've got multiple models interacting together, all with a bunch of callbacks defined. And you've ever been there trying to figure out exactly what's going on when you save an object. Uh, that can be quite difficult. And service objects can help with that. 
We can dry up controllers with them. So if you ever had a case where, let's say, you have an API version of the controller, API user's controller and user's controller, and there's some post condition that you need to do after you've uh, saved a user, that can end up being copied and pasted into your API versions of the controller. So we can avoid that with service objects. And we've made behaviors opt in instead of opt out. So if you have one of those behaviors, but it only applies sometimes, you can use the service object when you need the behavior, and you can just use the model directly when you don't, let's say for tests. So there's a number of cases where I like to apply the service objects pattern. This was an example of having multiple strategies, two different ways to do a similar thing. Um, also, just generally any operation which is quite complex, let's say placing an order for an e-commerce application is usually uh, got a lot of behavior associated with it. I would pretty much always have a service object in that case. Um, coordinating multiple models. Uh, the order when you create it needs to coordinate between the saved credit card table and also a shipping addresses table. External services, uh, you have to hit the payment gateway and then after someone buys something, you have to post it on Facebook to embarrass them in front of all of their friends. And uh, if there's a operation which is perhaps ancillary to the core life cycle of the model. So for example, let's say you have a job which needs to clean up data. You are running through you know, uh, your application every once in a while and just cleaning up some old stuff. That probably is not important enough for me to keep in the model where it's going to have top billing. Every time I open up the model, that's something I'm going to have to look at. I would just put that over to the side because that's basically how it runs and how you think about it. It's this thing over to the side. So you want those to match up. The third pattern is form objects. And form objects are a pretty block and tackle way to deal with the problem of having one form that needs to deal with multiple models. So you've got that, you get that mock-up from your designer, and the first thing you see is that the error messages are not rail style. So you say, oh god, that just tripled the amount of work. And the second thing you see is that it's going to write to two uh, different tables, and that you know tripled the work again, right? So Rails very quickly goes from being very easy to do forms to when you want to do the forms exactly how you want them, it gets very complicated. So form objects can help with that, and they're usually used in create and update flows. So new, create, edit, update. Um, let's look at an example. So this is how I've seen. Uh, I've seen this done a number of times. This is kind of using the active record object user to get some of the behavior that you could uh, otherwise deal with in another way. So in this case, there's an adder accessor defined for company, and that's so that you can put the user as the object for the form, and it's a text field company, and put in a company name. And then there's a callback that creates the company before you create the user. Now, there's a number of problems with this. Um, one company is kind of this like shapeshifter method where sometimes it's a string, sometimes it's an object. I, that can be quite confusing. Uh, also, it's not clear what happens if saving the user fails after saving the company. Let's say you have a uniqueness validation. I think it will run in a transaction, but the point is I'm not really sure and I don't really want to have to worry about it. And it's not very clear how you would create just a user and without having to worry about the company. So maybe that would be relevant for you in a test situation. Uh, the solution can be a uh, form object. So for my form objects, I like to use the Virtus gem. Uh, Virtus just lets you add some behaviors on plain Ruby objects to get attribute-like behavior. Uh, they will have an initializer where you can pass in a hash and the right thing happens. So it just kind of works. Um, and then you can add on some behaviors from the active model library, like validations. In this case, we've also exposed an adder reader for the user in the company. We'll see how that gets used in a second. Continuing, uh, you can just make this object quack like an active record object. So you can give it a save method, which first validates the object. And then if the validation is successful, you persist. If not, you just return false. And the persistence algorithm is quite simple. It's how you would basically describe it if you were talking to somebody. First, we create the company. And then we create a user which is associated with that company. Very natural, right? In the controller, you can basically use this object as if it were an active record itself. It's got an initializer which takes attributes and it has a save method. And after the save, if it fails, it will have an errors uh, object available on it so you can render it back out on the form. So what did we get out of this? Uh, I like this concept, which is to layer aggregation on top of the individual unit of work. I think this crops up in other cases in OO design where you separate the one case from the many, right? So the many is the form object that encapsulates things. 
that should be composed of the individual objects, which are the singular case. We've limited the responsibility of our active record models, and we've also provided a place to do contextual validation. So if you think about it, most of the validations in most applications that I've seen are actually contextual. These are the rules that we want to apply for new signups, but those rules might change as the business evolves, and it doesn't mean you can go back and invalidate all of the signups that have previously occurred. So often, the correct way to do the validations is to say validates x on create, validates y on create. Um, if the, you have a signup object, the validations that you define in it effectively serve as your validations for creating a user in a company. You can use this for aggregating multiple models into a form, and the uh, biggest thing here is accepts nested attribute for, I think is a probably my least favorite Rails method ever to enter that code base. Uh, it's had lots of bugs because it's a difficult feature, um, and it's one again one of those things we talked earlier during the security panel about simplicity uh, being a way forward. Accepts nested attributes for I think is a poster child where complexity breeds bugs and also smelly code. The fourth pattern is query objects. So query objects are just Ruby objects which encapsulate a simple way or a single way rather to query your database. And we'll look at an example. So this is pretty common. You've got a class and you've got, these could be name scopes or you could do class methods that are basically equivalent in Rails. Um, but you've got uh, accounts that are imported from a third party system and we need to run queries which join against the imports table in order to figure out which accounts are ready to be imported and which ones uh, failed during the import process. So, there's a few problems here. There's some duplication between the queries, and because this is uh, part of a class method, I have a whole rant about this uh, on my blog, but class methods, I think, are very difficult to refactor. You don't get to use your object-oriented toolbox, right? You don't really get to do composition, uh, inheritance. You can't leverage state uh, when you need it. You have to start you know, changing everything out from under it. And one of the bigger issues here, I think, is you've got this you know, I like to think about what gets top billing when I open up the account class. I'm gonna start by looking at the top of the file every time I open it, right? Do I really want every time I open the account class to see maybe you know, seven of these uh, methods which are full of SQL queries? That's not really the most important behavior of the account. So I would consider trying to get this out of there. And for me, whenever I drop down to SQL, it just really interrupts my flow when I'm reading Ruby code. Like, it's fine. I, I think that's the way to do it. I don't think we need some DSL to abstract away SQL completely, but it does break my flow a little bit when you have one language nested into another. So there's a solution in extracting query objects. You can just have an object which represents accounts which are able to be imported and pull out the logic that was previously in the class method. If you have a job that needs to iterate through uh, importable accounts, you can just instantiate the query object and call find each on it. It'll iterate through the block, paging through the accounts. And these are also composable, just like active record relations. You can say, you can compose a relation that says, oh, I want accounts that are older than one month ago. And you can use that in the initializer for the importable accounts query, and it will work as you expect. This lets the active record focus on the core behavior of what that domain model needs to represent in your application. We saw that they were composable. And having your behavior in first class objects rather than tucked away in th these named scope sort of special cases or even class methods encourages you to refactor them in subtle ways. You don't even necessarily notice it, but if it's in a class, on its own, and the class is small and manageable, there's no risk, really, in doing refactorings there. You can get a test around it, you can change it, you can compose things, and it just works. So I like to use query objects when you have uh, many scopes, if you've got that laundry list at the top of your class. If you have complex scopes, kind of like the one we saw, I would say anything where you have to drop down to SQL is probably complicated, uh, or rarely used scopes. So if you have a scope which is only used for one purpose in some special case job, it doesn't deserve top billing, so you can get it out of there. If the scope is simple and you only have a few of them, uh, let's say you have an active Boolean and you want to be able to pull out active accounts, uh, I would probably leave that because now we're talking about something which isn't going to interrupt the flow and is pretty core to the domain. The fifth pattern is view objects. So 
I use the term, this, people use lots of different terms, and I think it's basically so confusing at this point that there's no winning, so I'm just going to use my term. Uh, <laughs> view objects is the term that I use for objects that are backing up a template. And because of that, there could be a relationship of, uh, they could have a relationship with zero, one, or multiple models. So think of like LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn has this little widget on the side that tries to tell you uh, what you need to do next to complete your profile, and it tells you how far along you are in that process. Uh, this is one way that that could be implemented. You could put the logic into the user model, and you could have a method that returns the message and a percentage for how far along the process you are. Again, we see here that there is a repeated uh, word in the method name, so that's going to be your first clue that there's a refactoring that can take place. And also, sort of by definition, any kind of onboarding steps you have like this is not particularly core to the life cycle of the object, right? It's things that you would like people to do, but by definition, you can't even really force them to do it. So does it belong in user? I would say probably not. If I have an onboarding steps, .html.erb partial, that's going to be you know, your standard uh, module that you're going to render out. I would create an onboarding steps class that just provides the logic that is necessary to create that. So you initialize it with a user, and now you can simplify the method names. It can just have a message and a progress percent. So it's pretty simple. Um, there's a, uh, you know, if you've used something like mustache, then you're basically forced into doing this, right? You can't have any logic in your templates at all, so you're forced to write objects that um, produce the information for the views. I don't use that myself, but I sort of tend towards that, uh, closer to that approach than probably most applications do. Um, so you've simplified your templates. If you haven't read about the two-step view pattern, I think that's uh, an under, uh, a less understood pattern than it should be. Uh, it's, I believe, also in patterns of enterprise application architecture, and it talks about this very thing. Um, you can replace helpers with objects, which again lets you bring your refactoring toolbox rather than just having a bag of utility methods. And the first class objects encourage them, uh, you to refactor them. So, I like to apply the view objects pattern whenever there is display logic in the model. If there's logic which is delivery mechanism specific, so if I were to substitute an HTML interface with a voice activated interface, I was going to call my application and place an order over the phone. If the logic would not be relevant, then I would try to keep it out of the model. And whenever I have partials that aren't actually backed up by exactly one object, that's going to be the, uh, something that raises my eyebrow and makes me consider introducing a view object. If it's zero or if it's many models uh, that I'm having to interact with in a single template, then I'm probably going to reach for a view object there. Sixth pattern is policy objects. So this is about reads. We're going to encapsulate a single business rule inside of an object. Uh, so let's look at an example. In this case, it's that logic that everybody has to write and everybody hates it about deciding which emails should be sent to a given user. We need to make sure that the user's email address has not produced a hard bounce in the past. We also need to make sure the user settings enable them to receive notifications of the given type. And if the email is about a specific project, we want to make sure that the user is configured to receive emails about this project, right? So we've got something like four conditionals in here. And the key for me on this one is that it's kind of, it's a very important domain concept masquerading as a tiny, uh, you know, a five line method that's just floating in the sea of user RB. Um, asking questions like, when is a user going to receive an email are just the kinds of conversations that tend to happen a lot when you're interacting in a business around, uh, you know, a complicated application. The solution of going to user RB is not so great because it's mixed in with all this other stuff, and you don't have one place to go and say, okay, where, uh, what's a top level concept where I can find this information in my application? But if you introduce a policy object, then you can get all that. So I would introduce an email notification policy, which gets instanti uh, instantiated with a user, a notification type, and optionally a project. This is an example of a method object refactoring, and it just has a predicate method for deliver to determine whether or not uh, a given notification should be sent. So now you've got a clear place to go to look up that uh, logic. You've put one rule in one object, which is great, and these policy objects are first-class objects, so you can refactor them. Um, but also, interestingly, 
I find policy objects sometimes work well for aggregations. So if you're doing authorization, you might have a bunch of fine-grained policies, but then you have higher level policies which are use the fine-grained policies underneath. So you get like the composite pattern. Uh, I think that tends to be quite useful with policy objects. And I like them for complex reads as well as ancillary reads. So if it's um, a read which is simple, uh, and also very core to the model itself, then I would not pull it out into a policy object. I would leave it in the active record because that's where active record really shines. But something complicated, and I would say a conditional with four branches uh, is complicated by my standards, then we're going to pull that out into a core object if I'm working on it. Uh, the seventh and final pattern is decorators. So Decorators get used in lots of different ways, and I'm sure Steve could tell you some interesting things about decorators as well. Um, but generally, uh, they're about wrapping one object with additional behavior. So oftentimes this gets used in the view, uh, but we're going to look at an example in the model layer. The, what you end up with is an object that from the context of the uh, objects that are interacting with it, it is what it was before you wrapped it. It responds to either a sub, uh, section or the entirety of the wrapped object's interface. Uh, and then everything else can just not have to worry about what uh, the fact that the object has additional behavior layered in. So let's look at an example. In this case, uh, we have an order that needs to send receipts. But the receipts are only sent sometimes. If the order comes in through the standard web interface, we send a receipt. If somebody calls in the order to our customer service center or faxes it in, we don't want to email them a receipt. So have you seen this sort of thing before? You create an adder accessor and you are going to seed it with a Boolean value in perhaps your controller. Uh, and then based on the value that's been seeded into that adder accessor, you make a decision on what to do in the callback. So you either run or don't run the callback. I think sort of by definition here, you can see that this callback is not critical to the life cycle of the object. It only fires sometimes. So I would, uh, one thing, one way you can manage this complexity, and there's a, there's a few different ways you can deal with something like this, but you can do it with a decorator. So if you have an order email notifier, it gets initialized with an order, and it just provides a save method that if the underlying order save completes, then it will send a receipt. So when you're in your controller, you can build up the order with the appropriate decorators for the behavior that you need given the context of the controller, and then you can just operate on it as if it was a regular order. So for this controller, we want to send receipts because it's for orders coming in from the web interface. But in the customer service facing controller, we would just not wrap it and we would not get the behavior. This produces some interesting things. We've sort of separated arrangement from work, which I think is a, a very powerful concept when you can isolate the problem so you have one piece of code which is responsible for wiring all the objects together. Sometimes people call those factories, but people hate that word in Ruby. And the other side is actually doing the work. Um, and we've promoted the concept of emailing receipts to a first class object, and we've made it opt in instead of opt out. If you don't wrap it with the decorator, then you don't get that behavior. So that can be quite convenient. Uh, this is useful for contextual behavior. Also, external services, you never, ever, ever, ever ever want to make an external web service call in a callback that will cause you pain later, uh, and you will remember this now. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes you can use them in views. So that is the uh, seven patterns that we covered. I know that was quite quick, but uh, I want to leave you with one parting thought. Your application evolves, right? You start with a very little amount of functionality, uh, or sometimes you can refer to that as complexity, right? It's the intrinsic complexity it's of what your application needs to do. It's the things that you have to do in your app to actually provide value, to make a business money. That increases over time. And what m often happens is you find yourself in a mess, right? You don't do enough refactoring. You don't do enough thinking about architecture and design. So one day you wake up and you say, oh my gosh, it's very difficult to get anything done. That's not good. Uh, but at the same time, you also don't want to over-engineer things to begin with. You don't need to reach for very complicated designs uh, or more sophisticated designs and architecture if the application that you're working on doesn't warrant it yet. So ideally, 
You want to scale the architecture and design techniques that you're using up gradually as the behavior and the functionality that you need to encompass increases without making it in big jumps. So there's some ways to do that are in here. There are other projects and interesting resources for sort of looking at that problem. But you don't want to find yourself too far on either side. You don't want to have a mess. And you don't want to have something that just has more uh, objects and concepts than are necessary for your domain. That's all I've got. Thank you. Yes. Questions? Are we going to run the mics? Okay. I just get to stand down here. Uh, yes. Great talk, actually. Um, I just wanted to take a com comment on one thing, the forms that you did. Yes. We actually, uh, Rails Edge has active model model already. It's going to be something that's in four. And we actually yes. put that in our, we like grabbed that from uh, like GitHub Master, and we put that in config initializers, uh -huh. and then it simplifies all that boilerplate you have to do in forms. Because I, so Steve might know the answer to this, but I think that got pulled. That's did, active record model, which was the <laughs> I see. So active model model is still in. As far as I know, active model is still in. Yes. Yes. So you can use it on Rails three is the uh, takeaway, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. So you can use that today, even if you're not on Rails four. Anything else? Uh, yes. Schneems. Do you have a recommended place to put all of those class? Ah, yes. This is my favorite question. Um, where do you put this stuff? Do you put it in lib? Do you put it in app models? Do you create app policy objects, app query objects, all these things? Um, what's that? Ask Reginald. And we could ask him. Um, so uh, I will give you the answer. You ready? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, if you have the right objects, moving them from one directory to another is a very first world problem. Uh, the problems that most applications have are they don't have the right objects. So I don't mean to be glib, uh, but um, yes, I personally, uh, I just, for a while I put them all in app models and just laundry list in there. Um, I've done a little bit more trying to do modules and playing with some stuff in lib, but uh, you'll get accustomed to whatever standard you decide. So I would just pick one, try it, and then you can move it later. Uh, anything else? We have. Oh, it's okay. So to clarify, what you're saying is that finding the right place for your classes in Rails is very similar to working with an architect on your own custom-designed house. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a last few Code Climate stickers, so if people want those, you can come up to the front and get them. I have a question. Yes. When is Code Climate going to help me do this instead of just cyclomatic complexity stuff? Yeah, so when is Code Climate going to help you do this? Um, Code climate is not a replacement for engineers. <laughs> uh, so we can try to point you in the right direction. But the reason that uh, we all have uh, nice jobs that we like very much and get paid reasonably well is because no computer program can really figure out uh, which of these patterns is most appropriate in your domain. Uh, so I think your best option is to just try to keep learning about these things, experiment, uh, work with your team, and have discussions about you know, how the patterns are working out for you. Uh, if you feel like you are in a case of technical debt or if you feel like you over-engineered, you can course correct and go from there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so you end up designing with a lot of small objects. Yes. And how do you connect them? So you have big graphs and there is a lot of uh, create that class, create that class, yes. that and that dependency and that dependency. Yep. How do you solve it? Yeah, so how do you manufacture these? Um, well, in so, it depends. In some cases, like uh, in a couple examples, we just put it in the controller, right? We just instantiated the objects that we needed. Um, I do sometimes use the dirty word, uh, factory, and create factories that uh, separate the arrangement of the objects from the work, which I really like. So if you just have one place that's responsible for wiring up that object graph, and that might be your 
order factory or order processing factory, uh, and then you come out with an object, a single object that's going to do the right thing, I think that works great. How about dependency injection? Uh, yeah, so dependency injection is, right, it's a pretty fancy word for what turns out to be a simple concept, which is just not hard coding your uh, references in a way that they can't be overridden. Um, so I like to do, you know, I often use uh, initializer based dependency injection, passing in objects. We saw that with the query object. It basically has a dependency on account, but it's passed in in the initializer, so you could potentially substitute something else. Um, and sometimes I do use uh, attribute-based dependency injection, where I have a writer that allows me to replace an implementation. That would usually be for something like a payment gateway, where in a testing context, I want to just substitute in a stubbed payment gateway. OK, thank you. OK, so thanks very much, Ben. Thank you.